Welcome to the next video in the a local ecosystem topic. This video will be looking at the following dot point, outline factors that affect numbers in predator and prey populations in the area studied. So the area that we um, looked at was the mangrove environment or the, the, uh, the forest environment. We're actually going to have a, a look at a predator-prey relationship between foxes and rabbits, which is quite easy to look at. So when we look at these two animals, what is the relationship? Obviously, from the dot point, we can understand that one is the predator and one is the prey. So in this case, our snake would be classified as our predator and our frog would be our prey as the snake has hunted, captured and is now consuming the frog. So although animals eat living plants, this is not technically known as predation. The term is reserved for uh, those situations where one animal eats another animal, okay, usually of a different species. Okay, if we're eating animals of the same species, then that would be classified as cannibalism, something a little bit different. So this is known as a positive-negative relationship. Obviously, it's positive for the predator as they're gaining the energy requirements they need and negative for the prey as they do not survive the encounter. So a couple of examples, as we said, our snake and frog. Uh, some really obvious examples that we see in movies, on television, a lion and a zebra, a spider and insects and dolphins and fish. So both the predator and prey have major impacts on the uh, distribution of, and abundance of each other and each can cause the other's population to rise and fall in a fairly regular pattern. So if we have a look at this graph here, what happens with interactions between predator and prey species? So firstly, we have the number of prey species increases. So in this case, it could be a rabbit or in our uh, ecosystem that we investigated on the excursion, it could be the uh, number of possums. So the population increases, their birth rate, there's more food. So when the number of possums increases, there's now more food for our predators, which were our owls the powerful owls who survive in greater numbers and then the owls are able to reproduce so we have a fluctuation of the possums first then that provides more food for the predators or so the owls and then their population starts to increase slightly after that of their prey so as the predator numbers increase more prey get eaten so we have a greater number of predators, so therefore the number of prey begins to decline. Okay, so obviously they're being hunted and killed, so their population decreases. Then what happens is because the population of prey decreases, there's not enough food anymore for the predators to survive, and then their population decreases. Then when the population of predators decreases, it means that more of the prey are able to survive, so their population increases again. We've got more food for our predators and we just have this constant cycle with peaks and troughs that slightly lag one behind the other. So as we said, a couple of local examples from the excursion, we had the powerful owl that ate the ringtail possums. We were told that the kookaburras like to eat the blue tongue lizards and the ibis that lives in the mangroves likes to eat the crabs that live in the crab holes. And we talked about the adaptations that the IBIS has for dealing with that. So this here shows a predator-prey interaction graph uh, with years along our x-axis and the population size along our y-axis. Okay, so the graph shows a hypothetical predator-prey relationship or population numbers. The predator population hunts and feeds on the prey population and the graph shows their population sizes over a period of 17 years. So if we have a look from the graph, we can see that the prey population shows the greatest variation in numbers. So the prey population started off almost around the 200 mark and then dropped considerably to just above 50, so about 60. But then we can see we have this constant fluctuation, which is much greater than the fluctuation of the number of predators. The predator prey populations were fairly stable until year five where there was a dramatic decrease in the prey population. So that could have been the result of anything. So if we talk about our rabbits and foxes, um, it could have been the introduction of a virus into the rabbit population, which caused a great number of those to die off and therefore the population to decrease. 
Once the prey population declined significantly, you can see the populations of the two organisms began to fluctuate with a fairly steady time period between each of the peaks being approximately three years. Okay, so we have a peak here just after seven years and then a peak again just after 10 for our prey. And with our predators, we had a peak just before eight years and a peak just before 11 years. So showing that we have a fairly similar time span between the peaks. So there is a time lag between the peaks of the two organism populations, which is about a year. So that would be um, expected with life cycles and things like that. The prey population increases, provides food for the predators. The predators then reproduce, reproduce more offspring. And then once those offspring are old enough to eat the prey, then uh, the population of the prey would then begin to decline. So for the dot point, we also need to look at some factors that affect predator-prey populations. So there are a number of different factors that could affect the populations, including the number of predators competing for the same prey. So this is different species. We'll be looking at competition a little bit later. So um, with our example of the um, powerful owl and the ring-tailed possum, the owl competes with, say, foxes, cats and dogs, etc., to eat the ringtail possum. So if we have a greater number of predators trying to catch the same prey, then that could affect the population numbers. The availability of food for the prey, so if they're uh, herbivores, if are there enough plants, is there enough food to sustain that um, their first chain or the link before them in the food chain? The birth rate, how quickly do they reproduce? How quickly does it take for those offspring to reach maturity where they're going to have an effect on the food chain? Along with that, we also have the death rate. So in particular, as we said with the example from the graph on the previous slide, the exposure to disease could cause a massive uh, increase in death rate in a particular time of uh, time frame. The number of males and females, so obviously we need fairly equal numbers in order to be able to reproduce. The size of the ecosystem for supporting the predator and prey numbers Movement between ecosystems, so e-migration and immigration, so movement in and out of different ecosystems, and the number of shelter sites. So this obviously would be um, for those organisms that are being hunted, so the prey. So they've got some, if they have greater places to hide from the predators, then they're most likely not going to be caught. Okay, so that brings us to the end of this video, a nice short one, and thanks for watching.